Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, NJBIA, for the invitation, uh, inviting me to be here. Before I start, I do want to say a couple of thank yous. To thank you to my team from Subaru of America. They are in the middle of the room. I could not do what I do without them. And thank you to my personal board of advisors, my Aunt Patricia and my Aunt Linda, uh, and my three best friends are somewhere in the room, Shauna, Jean, and Chris. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. So <clears throat> the question that I typically get asked is, how did you get to Subaru? And how did you make it to the C-suite? And so to answer that question, I'm going to start, I'm going to actually take you back about 19 years. Uh, I was a director, small company, small credit card company in Delaware, and doing great work, loving what I do. I had grown up through that organization and had gotten uh, increased levels of responsibility and promotions and all the things that you look for in your career. And then one day, everything changed. One day, they brought us into a conference room and said, our company has been sold. We've been purchased by Bank of America. And that's really all that we can tell you at this point. At that, in that moment, it's also important to note that I was seven months pregnant with my second son. So in the months that ensued after that, I went through extreme highs personally, welcoming a new baby, my oldest son becoming a big brother, uh, just the joy that comes from that. But professionally, I, I had no clue. I had no idea if when I returned from maternity leave, I'd have a job. I didn't know if I'd even want to work for Bank of America. I didn't know much about the company. I knew it was a significantly larger organization than the one I came from. And so there were just so many questions sort of swirling around. I came back from maternity leave. I had to learn a new language, a new way of doing things. The first meeting I went to, they said something about a Kaizen. I had to look it up. I didn't know anything. I didn't know what that was. Uh, so whole new, whole new culture, whole new way of doing things. But through the next, through the next two years after that, um, I grew to love Bank of America. I love the Bank of America spirit, or what they called it then. Um, I love the culture. They did things very differently than we did, so I, I got to learn new things, learn new ways of work, and get to know an entirely new leadership team. Through that process, I felt like I was good again, right? I thought I would have retired from MBNA. That, that changed in June of 2005. Now, two years later, I'm with Bank of America, and I'm thinking, all right, I'll retire with Bank of America, great company. And then we got a new boss, and he came in and said, in, in really just in a matter of, of days, I'm going to restructure this whole organization, and so things are going to change. So then he met one-on-one -on -one with all of us, and in my meeting, he said, Renee, I like the work that you're doing. I want to make sure that you continue to do great work here. However, I'm going to be splitting your organization up. And so I'm gonna, this, this team is going to look very differently when I'm done. And so I just have a, one question for you. What do you want to do? I didn't have an answer. I hadn't given it any thought at all. I didn't have a career plan for myself. I had enjoyed some success at MBNA and really sort of went where the opportunities were, but I never really thought about the next thing. So... I said to myself, okay, I gotta figure this out. So he said, yeah, I'm gonna give you some time, but I really do need to know what you wanna do next. And, and through the next couple of weeks, the next month or so, all of the conversations, we're talking about a lot of great things, but nothing that I was interested in, nothing that I really wanted to do, and certainly nothing that I felt inspired by. So I started to look um, large, here and there at different opportunities, and then I got a phone call from someone who said, I know someone you know, talk about networking, I know someone you know, and they think you'd be great for this opportunity that I'm looking, that I'm searching for, that I'm recruiting for. So through a number of conversations, uh, I took an opportunity in a health insurance company in downtown Philadelphia. To go from working in Delaware, and I'm not gonna say my state is small, but it is, um, to go from working in Delaware where you pretty much drive to work, you go into your building, you come out at the end of the day, get in your car, and you go home. Now I'm working in downtown Philadelphia, so I'm taking SEPTA train to work. I get off the train, I find my way through Suburban Station, figure out how to get to the top, and then make my way to my building. And that first day, the visual I'll give you, some of you are too young to get this, but some of you will, the visual I'll give you is I felt like Mary Tyler Moore, at the opening of her show, 
I'm walking down Market Street and I wanted to throw my hat up and say like, I'm a big girl now. Like I felt like I had arrived. I'm now working in the big city. And uh, for the next year and a half, I started just doing what it is that I know how to do. I didn't know an HMO from a PPO on day one. I knew nothing about health insurance. And initially that felt like a risk to me. But at some point I started to see it as an opportunity to bring what I know. I had learned some really great skills from Bank of America and how do I bring those to this new company and how do I bring those to this new team. And so that's what I did. So for a year and a half, uh, I, my team and I were on a mission. We were improving customer scores, improving our metrics, and then my boss left. So that left an opening. And through a series of other uh, decisions that some of the other directors made, I ultimately was promoted to vice president of customer service. So I went from a director role where I had about 120 people on my team to vice president of customer service, 450 people in downtown Philadelphia, and my boss said, you got a couple of things that you're going to need to do. You're going to need to figure out how to break, break out the silos. Customer service in this company is a little bit of the haves and the have-nots. At least how the, that's how the, fee, the people feel. So I need you to figure out how to bring this together as one team. So at the time, one of the movies that was popular, well, at the time there was a saying, one band, one sound. And that was the mindset that I adopted. So I went about building this team to be a, a team that was nimble, but that was supportive, that worked together, that there were, no, there were no areas that were better than the other. We were all there to do the same thing, which was support our customers. And through six years, I built a team that I was so proud of. And we were doing such great work. And then the federal government said, we're gonna implement this thing called the Accountable Care Act. And when I tell you for health insurance companies at the time, it was the big unknown. We, didn't, we had no experience with individual plans. We didn't know how that was going to work out. We didn't know if we were going to be popular or not. We didn't know what our pricing would look like as compared to other health insurance companies in the marketplace. We were told to prepare for 80,000 new customers at its best. So if we were wildly successful, you can expect 80,000 new customers. Anybody want to guess how many we actually got? 300,000. So when you run a call center business, <laughs> the number of new customers is pretty important uh, to understand so that you can pr appropriately prepare. We had no idea. And so 300,000 new customers overnight, our volumes exploded. And so to give you some context, in health insurance, typically your busiest months are January, February, maybe March, because that's when new plans start and that's when people have their questions. We, back then, would get about 100,000 calls in January, which was one of our busiest months. The Accountable Care Act was implemented. The individual plans went live January 1st. On January 6th, we got 106,000 calls one day. We got a month's worth of volume in one day. And that persisted for the next six months or so. So we went from being a five-day-a-week uh, contact center to seven days, we closed at 6, but most days we didn't clear the queue until 10 or 11 at night, and it was chaotic. We went from a team that was what I would call high-performing, working well together, to being smack dab in the midst of chaos every single day. At some point, one of the consultants at the company's hired to help with the system transformation came to me and she said, Renee, i got to give you some feedback. And I said, okay. And she said, there are wartime generals and there are peacetime generals. You were an awesome peacetime general, but now your team is in the midst of a war. And your strategies are not changing fast enough and you're not pivoting fast enough to help your team to get out of this war. And I thought about it and I thought, I don't agree. The strategies that we use to get here have to be the same strategies that we continue to use to get out of this. And we will get out of it. The volume will come down at some point, and we will continue to resolve issues like we were. We will con continue to focus on getting things done for customers. I was, I was uh, opposed to giving customers homework, and that was the way that it worked back then. They tell you, oh, well, you need to go call your doctor. So we change that. So stop doing that. Now you call the doctor, get the information, help the customer to resolve things. In peacetime, that worked. In the midst of a war, it didn't. 
And I didn't recognize that fast enough, and I didn't pivot fast enough. And so about a week later, the executive vice president called me in, and she said, we're moving you out of customer service. You, have, you still have a job. I'm thankful. We're moving you to sales and marketing, and you'll be reporting to the chief marketing officer. Now, for some people in here, that might sound like that was a great thing. For me, it was not. I am a customer service girl born and bred. It is what I love to do. I have never been a person who enjoys sales and marketing, but I, it was a job, and I was thankful, and I was grateful for that. But I have to tell you, I went through all of the stages of grief at that time. I was losing the team that I had worked so hard to build. I was losing all of the things that, made, that gave me joy about coming to work every day. And I had to figure out how to get myself together really quickly because now I'm going over here and I have a new, a new team, smaller team, but a new team who's looking to me to be their leader. And it's not fair to them. So I had to quickly work through the stages of grief and get to the place where I could help this new team to perform and do the work that was ahead of us. And so that's what I did. But, but I was hurt. Um, my feelings were hurt. I felt like a failure. I felt like I had failed the team. And so I had to figure out how to dust myself off and, and get back on the horse, if you will. Ultimately, I did that. Two years later, uh, my boss, who was the chief marketing officer, said, and told me, called me in one-on-one, -on -one, and she said, look, I'm retiring. At the end of the year, I'll be retiring, and I believe that my boss, the, the president of commercial markets, is also going to retire. And so for me, at that point, I started to say, okay, is the handwriting on the wall? Like, do I need to start to consider what it is that I want to do? And then I started to ask myself some really hard questions, because I knew that this work that I was doing, I could continue to do, but it wasn't who I am. It, it wasn't what I enjoyed doing. It wasn't the kind of work I enjoyed doing. And I knew if I was really honest with myself at the end of the day, I wasn't being my best self. So I was fortunate enough through a series of conversations and discussions to, uh, to leave that organization, but with a smile on my face. I was happy to go. I knew that my time had passed. I knew that I'd never get an opportunity to go back and do the customer service work that I really wanted to do. And I knew that I owed my people more, I owed myself more, and I owed the company more. So I took a year off. Um, I was in a, in a great position to be able to do that. Took a year off and spent some time doing all the things that I hadn't done before, that I just hadn't made the time for. I went to PTO meetings. I, uh, I did, did field trips. I had never been the field trip parent. My husband had always done that. So I had the opportunity to do some great things with my sons and reconnect in ways that I didn't even know that I needed to. At the end of that year, Prudential Financial called and said, hey, we have this opportunity. We think it might be, you might be great for it. So I said, all right, well, let's talk about it. So through conversations, uh, I said, you know what? This is a great opportunity. I know nothing about investments. I know nothing about annuities or retirement or insurance products, that, those type of life insurance products. But customers I know. I know a little bit about customers and I know a little bit about building teams. So if we can make this partnership work, this might be a good opportunity. And for me, it was also an, an added challenge because most of my career I had done contact center. This was a combination of contact center and what we call back office. So I had claims responsibility as well. And that was an opportunity for me to learn some new things as well. So I take the job at Prudential Financial. They tell me you have six months and you have to get your FINRA licenses, your Series 6, 26, and 63. I'm in my late 40s now. I'm really involved in my kids' worlds now. I'm, I'm doing all the things with them that I hadn't had the opportunity to do before. And so I had to figure out how in the world I was going to study for these security and investment exams and be mom and be wife and continue to do the job that they hired me to do because the job didn't stop just because I, I had to take these exams. So through a series of really just hard conversations with myself, because one of the things that I always heard was, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. That was playing out for me. I kept telling myself, this is too hard. You don't know anything about this. You're not even all that interested in it, honestly. But it's a requirement for the job, so you got to figure it out. But you got all these other things to do on the weekends. You've got games to go to and all these other things. So 
I finally had to say to myself, okay, Renee, get it together. You got to figure this out because you have to pass these exams. This job is great. You're enjoying it. But if you want it to stay, this is what you have to do. And so I had to change my mindset around the task in front of me in order to be able to get over it. I was able to successfully pass those exams and then went on to have a really wonderful career at Prudential Financial. Pandemic hits, now we're all working from home. So now we all have to learn additional skills, right? How to lead in a virtual space, how to be present, how to show up virtually. What does engagement look like when all of your people are sitting in their homes? And so that was a fun time too. Challenging, a little bit stressful, but, but, but also fun. And then, so then my life sort of changed, right? So I would move to the corner of the room where my husband had set up an office for me uh, during the day, and then at night I'd come back and I'd sit on the bed. So one night I'm sitting on my bed, and I'm going through my personal email account. And typically when I do that, it's a lot of delete, because it's a lot of spam. So I'm deleting, 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 deleting. I get to this email, and this email says something about an email that they had sent me before, and I knew I hadn't seen that. So I, I replied. I can't tell you today why I hit reply, because typically I would have hit delete. But I didn't. I hit reply, and I said, can you resend the original email? I didn't get it. About 10 minutes later, an email comes back, and it says, I just need 15 minutes of your time. I want to talk to you about an opportunity. So I was like, yeah, no, I'm not, I don't, I'm not interested. I'm not looking for a job. I'm, I know that this is an executive search firm, so I'm just going to say no. My husband, sitting next to me in the bed, says, Renee, talk is cheap. Just, it's, just, it's just 15 minutes. Why don't you just talk to the person for 15 minutes? I said, I know it's going to be about a job, and I'm not in the market. And he said, well, you know people that are in the market, so is this an opportunity for you to maybe learn and pass on their information? So I was like, okay, all right. So I reply back, sure, I'll take the call. So uh, we set up an appointment for a couple nights later. My husband and my youngest son leave for fall ball. My oldest son is down the hall, supposedly studying for the SAT. I take this, uh, this Zoom uh, conversation with this woman. It's supposed to be 15 minutes. 45 minutes later, we're still talking. And I'm intrigued a little bit, but still not necessarily thinking that I'm, I'm interested in looking for a job. Uh, but I am intrigued. And so she says, um, let me tell you about the opportunity. It's for Subaru of America. And I said, let me stop you there. I don't want to live in Michigan. I'm not interested in relocating. And I don't know a lot of folks in my network who are either, so I don't know if I can really help you. So she said, well, let me stop you. It's, <laughs> Subaru is in New Jersey. I was like, wait, there's a car company in New Jersey? She said, yes, they are located in Camden, New Jersey. I was like, okay, well, that's an hour for me. All right, well, that's less of a commute than I have now. When we were in the office with Prudential, my commute was an hour and a half to Willow Grove. So I said, Okay, so she kept talking. So she said, well, look, let's do this. I'm going to send you a packet of information. You review it. And if you're interested, let me know. And we'll schedule you for a video interview. So I said, okay. So the next day I get the, oh, so sorry. I skipped the part. So I hang up the phone with her. My son comes sprinting down the hall. Mom, did that lady say the job was with Subaru? I said, yeah, she did. He said, did she say something about you get a car? I said, <laughs> yeah, she did. He said, you got to go for that job, mom. You got to go for that job. Now, in all of his life, at this point, he's a, a, a junior in high school, junior, senior in high school, never had an interest in any job I've ever had. And all of a sudden, he's super interested. So, and because we're all home now, now they're invested in the process, right? So, so the next day, I'm thinking about it. My husband is now weighing in. My baby is weighing in. And everybody's like, you got to go for it. You, this is something you have to do. So... I think, I'm, I'm like, let me think about it. And so I read the packet that she sends. And man, I'm like, wow, I've never seen a job description that I check off every box. It's like it was written for me. There were some visionary uh, leadership qualities that they were looking for. And I promise you, if you had polled folks that had worked with me in the past and asked, if Renee has visionary leadership qualities, what are they? They would have listed exactly what was on this packet. And so I was like, wow, this is... This is, I'm intrigued more. Still don't know that I want to go through an interview process, but I'm intrigued. So I say, let me think about it. So I toss and turn all night long, just thinking, 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 thinking. I get up the next morning. At 7.05, I get a text message. This message is from a woman who I had met earlier in the year at a women's multicultural retreat. 
and we just connected. There's just something about her spirit, her energy, like we just connected. And so we stayed in touch after the retreat. She would text me, I would text her, things like that. And she's what I would call a motivational speaker and author, right? And so her text messages were usually in that vein. So this one was, was like that, very similar, but the last three words of the text message were, go for it. And I was like, go for it? Go for what? That doesn't even make sense in context of this text. What is she saying go for? So I say this out loud. My husband's like, well, you know what I think. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, no, I don't know what you think. He said, well, I kind of think that maybe that's somebody speaking to you, telling you that you need to consider this opportunity. So I was like, uh-huh. So I go through the day working, that night I sit down and I'm like, all right, God, is this really what you want me to do? Because I don't know that I have the energy at this point to even go through an interview process. Um, but if, if, this is what, if this is what's in my spirit that I should consider doing, then I'm not going to say no. So I agree to do this first video interview. The video interview went an hour and like 20 minutes or something. We just had a great conversation, great time talking. My children made sure I had coffee before the interview, so I was prepared. Um, and so she followed up with me two days later and said, the folks at Subaru of America want to meet you. So I'm going to schedule four video interviews. So I did the four video interviews and still not completely sold that I was wanting to leave Prudential, but interested as, and as the more folks that I met, the more people I met, the more I thought this is something a little different. So then she calls and she says, okay, here's, ne here's what's next. They want you to come in for two days of interviews. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Did you say two days of interviews? <laughs> she said, yes. I was like, okay. She said, and, and they want you to come in on Thursday. This was like Tuesday. I said, so that's not gonna happen. <laughs> uh, I, haven't told my, I haven't told my boss at Prudential that I'm even interviewing, so I'd have to do that in order to take two days off. Oh, by the way, remember, this is COVID. So I'm like, so Prudential is still 100% work from home. I'm like, are they even working in the office? And she was like, about 10% of their staff is coming into the office, but the folks that you need to meet with will be there. So I was like, okay. So now I really got to make a decision because now this is like serious time. Like I'm going in for days of interviews. So my husband and I had a long conversation. I said, all right, well, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to, going to go for it and see what happens. So the first day of interviews was at the headquarters building in Camden, New Jersey, beautiful building if you have time to, 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 uh, to drive by in Camden. And so I went in, I met with the same four people that I had met with prior, but it, those were videos, so this was face to face. My 10 o'clock was with the president and CEO, Tom Dahl. So at 9.45, I'm like, huh, where do I go? I don't know where to, I, this doesn't tell me where I'm, where I'm going. Like, is somebody gonna come and take me to his office? I, I had had the experience of meeting and being in, in, in the presence of CEOs and presidents of the other companies that I had worked for. And so I kind of knew how it went, right? Somebody comes, they walk you up to their office, they sit you in the waiting area, and when it's your turn to go in, they come and escort you into the office. So I'm, I'm at now it's like 9.55 and I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna be late because I don't know where I'm going. I, am I supposed to find his office or like what's, what's happening? At 10 o'clock in the door, in the conference room where I was, comes Tom Dahl. He came to me. And so I said, huh, this is already something different. And so after a wonderful conversation with him and then a, an, another several uh, interview conversations that day, the end of the day, our HR business partner, who's here today, Kim, she came up and she said, we're going to give you a car to take home. And I was like, uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm good. I'm good. I got a car. I drove here. I'll drive it home. And she was like, are you sure you don't want to take the car home? I was like, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> I, I'll drive my, my Toyota home. And... The next day, my next series of interviews was in the actual building where the team that I would lead was, was working. And so the meetings that day were with the members of the team. And so prior to that, the gentleman who was the hiring manager, who was the chief marketing officer for Subaru, Alan Bethke, uh, Alan said to me, there's a couple challenges that I want you to kind of, when you're talking to folks tomorrow, I want you to kind of see if you can get your hands around. So, uh, I ended the, my interviews ended at like four, and, and he had asked me to join him for dinner at six. 
So I said, hey, can I meet with the whole team from like four to five? So I met with them and I put out there the challenges that he had shared with me and they had fabulous answers. They knew what the challenges were and they had great answers. I just don't know that they had been asked. So at six o'clock I go meet him for dinner and so I'm prepared to tell him like, hey, you, you don't really need me to get the answers to these problems. They have the answers, you just gotta ask them. We have dinner, we have a great conversation. He had already heard about the meeting, he already knew about it, probably from Kim. But he already knew about it. And so, uh, so we have a great conversation and after dinner, he slides this envelope across the table and he says, we'd like to make you an offer and I'd like to go through it with you. And I was like, wait, what? It took me, I don't know, four or five months of interviews to, uh, for the role at Prudential. And so this was two days of interviews and now he's, he has an offer, he's sliding this offer across the table. So he goes for the offer and I think, wow, I didn't know companies did things like this for people anymore. I didn't know companies were this good to people anymore. This is literally an offer I can't say no to, but I gotta go home and talk to my husband. Now, of course, I know what my husband was gonna say, but I said I gotta go home and talk to my husband. So I did, I go home, we have the conversation, I accept the offer, I start at Subaru, and I realize quickly that I am one of the most blessed people um, to have had the opportunity to work in this, in this wonderful organization with what I will tell you is one of the best teams in the business. Over the next year, uh, Tom called me in his office one day and he said, look, we are promoting you to the executive committee and you'll be reporting directly to me. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I went from reporting to Alan, now I'm reporting to Tom. I underestimated how big a deal that was, n not just for me, but really more for my team. It was the first time that we had a seat at the table, that we had a voice at the table, and so that was super powerful for them uh, but also, just in the community at large, they asked me about doing a press release, and I was like, yeah, okay, who's going to read it? South Jersey Times? I, who's going to read it? Nobody really cares. And they, they released this press release, and the response was overwhelming from women and uh, African-American people, people of color around the country, just supporting and excited about Subaru's first person of color on the executive team. And so I, I continue to, to always get that question, like how did you end up at Subaru and how did you end up on the executive team? About a year into being on the executive team, I'm sitting around, sitting in the kitchen, I think one day, and like a ton of bricks, this thought came over me. And I was like, you know what? Everything that happened in my career had to happen in order for me to get here everything that happened, the things I didn't like, the things I wasn't happy about, the things I felt like were, were failures and loss. But if those things hadn't happened, I'm not here. I'm not standing here, and I'm not at Subaru. If MBNA wasn't sold, I would have retired from that company. I would have never made it here. If, if they hadn't moved me out of customer service at, at, at that health insurance company and moved me to a different role that, that really wasn't a, a great fit for me, I, I'm still there. I'm still working there. And so that was, it like literally like a ton of bricks, it, it hit me that every single thing has led me to this place, this role, and this position. So when I get the question, how did you end up at Subaru? How did you end up on the executive team? That is the answer. And for me, it really just is a story. My story is really a story about understanding your situation, not seeing risk, but seeing opportunity, and really going for it. So if there's three words that describe my story, it is go for it, and I would encourage you, if you have the opportunity, you see something out there that you think, maybe, maybe not, go for it. You never know what could happen. You could end up with NJBIA inviting you to be a TED Talk style speaker on their stage. Thank you. I'm a hugger. I'm a hugger too, for sure. <laughs> so, so I have to say, uh, I feel like I have a soul sister because- You, you know, do, and I was a Girl Scout too, by the way. And I, started, and I started my career in the Girl Scouts. I was a field executive and director of communication at Chesapeake Bay Girl Scout Council, so. If you tell me you're a Virgo, I'm gonna fall down now. I'm a Cancer. Okay, yeah. that means we have great synergy. But I, I have to say, the things you just said about like, you know, your life's work leading you to a certain place, right? Yeah. 
that's you know that's what I'm celebrating my 10 years at BIA. I, right. I never like you talked about getting that job description and checking every box. I sat at my counter that night and I and my husband comes home, he goes, What are you doing? I said, It's my resume and it's the job description. Bam, right? Yep. And I talked about that great board, right? The chair yes. of the board at that time, Matt Wright, drove the job offered to me to Robbinsville at a meeting at five o'clock because I was scheduled to go on vacation two days later and he said, we wanna make sure we seal the deal before you go. That's right. Right. I mean, what amazing stories, what a great life for you. Thank and you. as you said, and you followed your calling and your passion. Thank yeah, you thanks. so much for sharing. Thank you. Fab. Thank you. Fabulous.